Prince called me uh, when the tour started and said, I really would like you to come work for me at, uh, on, as a road manager. And I said, thank you, but no. And stayed. And then a couple of days later, a week later, he called me again and said, I really would like you to do this. I think you'd be good at this. And I said, thank you, but no. Then he called me like, November, almost this time, yeah, yeah, because it'd be, uh, uh, it was like two days before Thanksgiving, and said, "Listen, I really would like you to be the road manager." And I said, "You know, I had nothing planned, you know, no films." I said, "Okay," and I said, "I'll be there right after Thanksgiving." He said, "No, you'll be here tomorrow," and hung up on me. <laughs> Welcome to Propellant Minnesota. Today we're diving into the extraordinary life and career of Craig Rice, a titan in the Minnesota music, film, and art scenes. From his early days managing Prince and building Paisley Park, to programming for the Minneapolis-St. Paul International Film Festival, and directing Emmy Award-nominated documentaries, Craig's journey and his stories are nothing short of remarkable. Today he'll share those insider stories, including how it's virtually impossible to say no to Prince and the clever ways Prince would get him back. We'll also get an insider's view of what it takes to program one of the most prestigious film festivals in the Midwest, insights on why Minnesota's creative scene should forge its own unique path, and a treasure trove of wisdom for creators both young and old. It was an honor and a joy to speak with Craig, and I'm sure you'll learn to appreciate him like I do. Please enjoy the conversation. First of all, Anybody who makes films needs to understand that film is an art form first. First, then it's just, then the story aspect of that art form is secondary to that. So respect the images, respect the process and the technology and the technique of doing that, and the discipline that it takes to make a film. Because you and I both have seen films where you need to focus the camera. You know, <laughs> I mean, so those are the things. But I think that the the tentpole tentpole movies are just the Hollywood's way of making money. I mean, Hollywood sucked up on a lot of people who had would have been in Wall Street if Wall Street was still open to that amount of people. They're just there to make money. They don't care about creating anything. Um, I, I was lucky enough when I was at USC to meet and talk to Jack Warner, the last of the Warner Brothers, and he was complaining about that. That was actually the end of the 70s, early 80s. He was saying, these people in here that are in here now, they don't care about the product he said nobody's got their name on a building you know he said my name's on the building and I care about that you know it's a Warner Brothers picture so I care I think that so you have people that don't and they're going to go wherever the largest amount of money is or can be made I think younger people what they have to understand is that if you want to make those kind of movies that's great do that I mean you know obviously Marvel movies go through directors like you know kids in a candy store they just pick one and then do it and then they Machine. burn them out and then get another one mm-hmm. But I think that what filmmakers who want to make films specifically in the narrative tradition or some type of narrative tradition have to think of a smaller um, income level or accept the, the fact that the, the infinity pool in Malibu was not in your future. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so dang that's it. what I think. Yeah, yeah, dang it. <laughs> it's beautiful, but hey, you know, you know, it's not cheap. And there's a lot of strings attached. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, I mean, again, if you ever look at the list, if you ever get a chance to look at the list of directors that Marvel has gone through, I mean, it's mind-boggling. I mean, they're just, you know, they're in, yeah, I mean, it's great if that's what you want to do. You know, I got no complaints about it, and I ain't hating. I'm just saying it's like I didn't come into this business of, of filmmaking in, in filmmaking, meaning film or television making, for many other reasons that I wanted to try to do the best work that I could and tell what I considered sort of realistic naturalistic type stories yeah yeah i'm uh i'm frankly concerned Mm -hmm. about the future of film right now because it's either you're playing with the streamers or you're not yeah you know uh and i don't know if there's an economic model right film is it doesn't have to be expensive but it's not free Mm -hmm. to to make yeah you know so how do we how do we build that world in which you know artists can you know recoup or make a living or at least have the capacity to take the time mm-hmm. to go make, you know, whatever, or tell whatever story they need to tell. Yeah. And, and, and to be able to, I think, I don't know if you're ever going to be able to make a living at just doing a long form film ever again. And on this level, I think what you might be able to do is to make the next film. Um, you know, I think that there's going to, and I'm not, well, I tell you one of the reasons why I actually took the job at the film society um, initially. And, 
uh, other than just to, I, I got there when you know it was kind of needed some help assistance I should say um, and I didn't mean to be there for 12 years now <laughs> I really didn't I wanted to be there for one year help and then leave but um, what I learned though is I learned a lot about exhibition and distribution and I didn't I really I didn't know anything about it before and I think it's important for filmmakers to understand that. So before you make a film, where is this going to go? Where can, who will take this film? Um, why, why do I want to make it? And why would anybody else want to watch it? Those kind of things you got to start asking yourself as opposed to just, I want to make a film, I want to make a film, I want to make a film. I think the, 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 that's there. But I think there's going to be a group of people, um, what we talked about before, business people, who actually understand this independent filmmaking process and can come up with a, a distribution or exhibition model that can actually work. And there were, I don't know if you're old enough to remember, um, Suncoast, and and um, there was a place in Utah that used to to, to four-wall films, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, where they actually uh, take small, small films and take them around, sort of bicycling them around the country and, 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 and making enough revenue to make the next picture. I think that is a model that needs to possibly re be revived. And you can do that streaming-wise, too. It's just that somebody has to have the, the, the gumption to do that and not try to make a small fortune um, doing it, but just to make the company make sense to them and say, okay. And it, because it worked in the record industry. I mean, you know, uh, you know um, uh, was it uh, Ruled by Not Ramen or whatever that company, that, that small record company, it's that kind of an approach where you get some guys, you know, together and, you know, the group does this, you know, and they may have a dozen projects and they just work them around the country. And, and Ava started that with Array. I mean, it's not there now because she's Ava DuVernay now. Yeah. But when her company initially was small and it just kind of distributed films and, um, you know, on a smaller scale. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of these films now are competing with essentially free, right? Mm -hmm. If you're paying for Netflix 20 bucks a month, you have $10 billion worth of yeah. You know, content yeah, yeah, available yeah, yeah, now, yeah. Uh, and it, it's hard to compete on that level. So I yeah. think, you know, putting in the the legwork, mm -hmm. and I think in person is still mm -hmm. a very important thing. Yeah, and yeah. you know that at the festival, yeah, um, yeah. people are still showing up. They need a reason to leave the house because yeah. we stare at screens all day, mm -hmm. and you need you yeah. need that. You know, and the communal experience too, yeah. which I think, you know, watching with your you know partner, yeah. you know, in your home cinema is great. Yeah. But you're not getting the communal experience. No, I, that... think, I, I think that, you know, I don't know if you've come to, I do this, the first story is at the Capri, and it really started um, probably eight years ago, almost nine years ago. And I did it because I realized people were, were not coming to the theater because they don't understand the different experiences, which is you're talking about right now, which is there was a time when we, uh, most of us went to church, synagogue, or, or mosque, or whatever, and that was our communal exchange with people and the, and the feeling and the humanity. I think. Cinema probably is a, is equivalent to that, so it's kind of our electric church kind of experience where we get together and we feel other people's response, and and you get the chance to talk to other people about what they saw, and you you sense it, and I think that's important. I think our disconnect as a society right now it comes to the fact that we we spent again a couple of years not being around anybody other than the person you were at, with at home, and we need to get back into feeling other people. I mean, we are tribal people, and the lack of that is suffer we suffer from that and i think that film can bring that together and it doesn't have to be it can be barbie it can be whatever film it doesn't have to be you know sort of a deep european <laughs> drama <laughs> about the quality of life you know but it can be just something that i think is just um connects and if, even if it's laughing together that's important you know i mean that's what you know again you you when films first, and I'm old enough to remember when TV started, so you know they put laugh tracks in there because they realize people don't like to laugh alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's true. I mean, there's this concept now called the third space, mm -hmm. where you know people had home and they had work, mm -hmm. and then they had the church or mm -hmm. they had mm -hmm. the cinema or mm -hmm. whatever. A lot of people have lost like home and work are now the yeah, same thing, yeah, yeah. you know, and they don't have that third space yeah, where they can yeah, go. Yeah, and and commune yeah you know yeah, or yeah. connect yeah um and yeah hopefully you know we come through the last couple of years and that becomes a you know it comes back but yeah. um we just have to we have to make it happen yeah yeah and so i encourage some people uh, younger people specifically or and younger than me i should say to really think about the business of filmmaking and find themselves not just behind the camera but behind the film 
uh, um, and see if they can come up with a way to to make it a smart business move. You know, yeah. Um, so ruled by ramen. That was the name of the, the big record company. You know. Yeah. So you're you're one of those guys that when you look at your list of accomplishments, you're like, how is this one person? How have you crammed <laughs> this much adventure into one life, and you got a long way to go yet? Yeah. How how have you done that? How have you you know piled up all these amazing adventures and and? I think that for me it was um, uh, first of all I got I got to give credit where credit is due. My parents were very much into the arts and all arts. I mean we went to the symphony on Sunday sometimes and we theater and uh, my mother was a very good sort of graphic uh, artist drawing. Um, we had music in the house, everybody in my family, except for one of my brothers and I had eight of them, brothers and sisters, and played an instrument. And so it was it was just exposure to that. And they encouraged it, and they didn't ever discourage it, ever. Whereas I always wanted to make films, as you know, since I was five years old. So they never like said, no, you should need to get a real job. You know, I wasn't until I was probably, after I quit Prince, when my mother said to me, said, um, well, maybe now you should find something else to do. I said, yeah. I said, Mom, I've made it this far with doing just what I'm doing without trying to take on it. I guess she always wanted me to be a social worker, which is maybe the bane of my life. I should have probably done that. Well, you're not not a social worker. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I guess maybe that's actually a good point. Maybe it is. I think that maybe it is. I really. She says you just care about people and you want to help people. So, um, so I try to do that in this kind of scenario, which is you know sort of my playing field. Um, I, I think that the other side of it is they were supportive, but I think I've always tried to do. I tried to, I tried everything that came to me, you know, from if it was, I mean, I, I played music and I, I'm, I was good at it and I can do that because like if I can hear something, I can play it. Um, filmmaking was what I wanted to do and I didn't actually know that you could go to school to do it. I, I could read the books and I went, went to the movies, and especially when I was on tour, you know, I were playing music and I would always be the one that would go to the movies and and uh, and reading books and that stuff, but I didn't know how to how you did. It. I bought a Super 8 camera and just was you know, I didn't know what I was doing. And then uh, somebody t- talked to me about uh, going to school to make this. And I had college. I said you can learn this in college. <laughs> I was like, what? They teach this the, literally that it week. It was so I mean, abstract to you yeah, before, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I decided that week I decided to sell my my gear. I quit the group that I was playing with and sold my gear and signed up for MCTC. And, um, but you know, I think for me, it's just, just in, in everything I've done has not been successful. You know, I mean, I just think you, you have to kind of go with what you think is the experience. And I've been lucky enough. And also I, part of it is, um, my wife has said this, I will try, I'll talk to people about things, you know, I, I, I mean, I don't, I mean, well, they can say no, and I've had a p- plenty of no's. And so when I try for something, if it's, you know, um, somebody calls and said, you know, you know, you need to talk to this person, I've always taken the meeting. You know, I was given that advice: always take the meeting, um, and ask for just ask for a meeting, and and go into the meeting, not expecting. I mean, not always trying to get the money. I think some people try too hard to get the money, and and I go in and just meet them, and and then ultimately. Um, the relationship will build from that as long as you, you're honest and truthful and, and, and genuine. You cannot usually relate, have a relationship with them. I mean, I met Lee Lynch, who had Carmichael Lynch, when I was still in high school, and you know he was making a movie. It's like you know, got a meeting, you know, and I didn't ask for money. I just wanted to be involved in it somehow. Just if, even if, it was, even if I had to hold a light stand, I wanted to do that, you know. And of course, he did this like you don't know anything about this, but he all these years to this day, you know, the relationship started there and then other things. And then I've had, he has invested in, in, you know, in the couple of projects that I've been involved. So that's, it's just, I've known him most of my life, you know, and that's really what it's about. I think that, that I, I think that's what it is. I think also I genuinely am excited about everything. You know, I, I tell my students and any young person, you really need to, make films but you need to start out at the bottom i mean be a pa and you know my one of my first shoots as a pa other than commercials and when i was in la with features was yeah i was in the parking lot most of the time but i learned i watched and 
I, I probably learned my best lessons on a feature film in the parking lot with the Teamsters because they could tell you because they, they got no skin in the game. They're driving a truck, but they actually paying attention. And you learned a lot of new words. Yeah, probably. a lot of new words, and you know how to really do production and how the truck should be. Where you know where are we going to go next, and how long will we get there? And you know, turnaround as everybody knows in in this business and is is an expensive and you know changing locations is one of the most expensive things. And you realize you know. That's the kind of stuff you realize, but just by being there, if I only stayed by the camera the whole time, and you know, I, I, those are the kind of things about making films that, again, I tell you, people, filmmakers need to understand this is a business. It's and that's unfortunate because that's what holds us all back, holds me back, holds you back, holds most filmmakers back because it costs money. It's not like we're painting paint pictures. We're actually trying to get money to make the pictures that we want to make. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Totally. So, would you say maybe at the core of of who you are, at least professionally, is maybe a sense of curiosity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like you're always looking to learn and the best way to learn is through these experiences yeah. or talk to people. Yeah. Uh, do, do you find that to be true? Like, yeah, no, I, I mean, I'm extremely curious about most things. I mean, not medicine, but most things. Yeah, and it's a, so if somebody comes up with something and I say, yeah, I'll I try that. Let's, let's see where that goes. And even, even I did that, I, I had... My perfect example is me working um, when Prince, when I was had been, I had never managed anybody. I'd had, 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 had with a group that had a manager when I was younger. And so when I had done, finished Purple Rain and Prince was asking, you know, we need to start a record company. And I didn't know anything about record company really, but he said, well, you're going to need a group. So got a group and, I, and they need a manager. Well, I'll manage them. I have no idea what that is or how that works, but I kind of remembered what the manager did. And then I studied and read and went to the library and I loved the libraries. I mean, you know, I tell everybody, read, read, read. I've read legal books on publishing and uh, all that on contracts or contracts. And so then I became a manager and, and I did that and, and it was great for a while. And then when I, then when he built Paisley Park, he said, we need somebody to run this. I had never run anything in my life. So I said, okay, you know, and I did it and jumped in and I made sure that it was a kind of facility that, that I, you know, the, my conversation with him was let's create, let's run this building, but let's run it like a stealth bomber that bombs creatively that we're going to, load this building up with the most creative forces we possibly can. That's, That's bring, awesome. You know, and so I ended up studying about how <laughs> bombers are structured. About So we need we need to find people that we can put in here that are going to just run the studio. And then we'll, we in the daytime, artists don't like to record, and most recording artists don't like to record in the daytime. So I said, so what we'll do so we don't, we have money, is we'll get churches to record in the daytime and give them a special rate. And then at night, then we'll have the recording artists come in. And, you know, that it was a process of really understanding that, but just really ap approaching it, but figuring out how to make that work. If you, know? you had experience, you know, running something before, you probably wouldn't have come to those conclusions, yeah, right? Yeah, because, yeah. you know, you'd have been like, this is the way it's done. But you got to come in with some newcomer energy mm -hmm. and highly creative and curious, and got to look at it a different way. Yeah. You know, I think there's a there's a message. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's what that's I think that's what for me that's the curious. I want to I, I I also want to learn in the process, and so, but it's really kind of coming at it a different way as opposed to saying I'm going to school for business. I didn't didn't do that. People think I did. I never did. I just studied and and figured out how, what would make this work well. Yeah, you know. Speaking of Prince and learning, would you mind telling us your uh, the Joni Mitchell oh, story? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I can tell you that. That that's an interesting one. Um, so we were on tour. I was Prince's road manager at this time, and I was on the Purple Rain tour. Um, and um, I, and I'm I knew who Joni Mitchell, Joni Mitchell was. It wasn't like I didn't know who she was, but I had never really listened to her work. I had heard, you know, some. I mean, her famous blue and things like that but um uh we were we were in houston and it was a saturday and he said he talked about Joni mitchell and he said do you like Joni mitchell i said nah she's, i see her she's fine she's just a folk singer and i'm not necessarily into folk music he probably said, wasn't cool to it, like Joni mitchell yeah i mean world, you yeah. know it's like i had you know so like, you know judy Cow i mean all there was just all these folk people and i was never kind of into folk music folk music um i did like bob dylan though i liked his lyrical structure that's what i really loved about him but so anyways 
So that day he's, he, he called me back because we were together when he brought this up. And then he called me back and said, listen, I want Johnny Mitchell's got a new laser disc out uh, um, and I want it. And I said, OK, so I, it's a Saturday. So it was Saturday morning. So I called Warner Brothers. And of course, they're closed. You know? And then finally, it, as the days, night hours go by, he said, you know, did you, I said, I'm working on it. So I started calling around and got hold of, of somebody who said it's not out yet. I don't know where he got the idea that it's, not, it's still in the warehouse. This hasn't been shipped yet. So I finally called him and got the warehouse uh, owner's number. The, who had it, I, had, I called him and said, listen, I need this t- you know, tonight. I need to get this to, to Houston. And she said, well, I can get it to you Monday. No, I said, I need it like now. So he said, I said, wait there. And there used to be a, wait, a company called Sureway. You know, I used to do film delivery and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. They, were, they would pick up the film and then take it to, and they buy a seat on the airplane and ship it to this. That's so Sureway. So I knew who they were. So I called Sureway mm-hmm. and I said, Sureway, I need you to go to the Warner Brothers warehouse and get this disc right now and put it I'll buy a seat for it, you know, you just put it in there because you wanted to be in the plane and not on the uh, in the baggage. So did that. So it's like probably now, probably almost midnight in 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 L.A. times and I'm still pumping. So now I got it coming. OK, and then it, it, I know it's going to be in. Now I have to find a, a laser disc machine, you know, and it's like, OK, so I mean, and this is this is phone book time. This is Yellow Pages time. So this early eighties. Yeah, or? this is yeah. This is uh, mid eighties, mid eighties. So it was like I got the used to and looked under electronic stores, and so I took out all electronic stores that had people's names there, and then I went into the white pages to put the names together with the people and was calling people literally in the middle of the night in Houston. You know, it's like, do you own an electronic store? <laughs> you know, and I, so until I finally got one, he said, yeah, I own this store. So why are you calling? I said, I need a laser disc machine now. He said, what? I said, I need it now. I'll pay you whatever it costs, but I need it now. So finally I got the guy, he went down there. I had, 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 um, one of the, uh, assistants go, be at the store when he opened it up to get the laser disc and bring it to us at the hotel. And I had the Shearway deliver the disc. Then I had to find the amps and stuff to set it up. So I took it out of Prince's tour bus. I just I, just, I told him, just tear it out of the bus. We'll figure it out later. Let me get this set up. Got it set up. Speakers, everything. It's playing. And luckily, the guy from the electronics store really helped me because I didn't know anything about laser discs. He actually helped to set it up. So he was really a, a really nice guy. I owe him a lot for that. So I played it back, set it up. I called Prince and said, okay, you got it. He said, now sit down and watch it. And he had done this for me so that I would never be closed off about artists and artistry and, you know, and development, you know. So it was a life lesson for me, you know, not getting the disc as much, which was its own life lesson, but the other side of it was don't close yourself off to art- artists on any discipline, any genre. Or anything like that, and so yeah, that was. Yeah. You learn something, then you learn something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. On that yeah. One. yeah, I love that story so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's yeah, it just it, to me, you could view it as like, oh, he was just you know um, hazing you, razzing you, mm-hmm. trying to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But then you look at the ultimate message, yeah. and like, yeah. oh, he was trying to you know yeah. keep yeah. me open. And, and, I, and I fell in love with Joni Mitchell, and then later on in life, I ended up having a chance to meet her and. Oh, no, and talk kidding. to her and stuff. Yeah, it's, it, because I mean, I did. It's like, oh my God, she's fantastic. She's incredible. She's not just a folk artist, you know, strumming a guitar. She's actually somewhere between folk and jazz and, I mean, poetry. And yeah, you know. It she's was, had a little comeback. She's out there doing it. Yeah, still. Exactly, exactly, yeah, exactly. Again, yeah, to this day. So, Is there anything that you're proudest of that you've accomplished professionally? I know you have family and stuff, obviously. Greatest creation is your kids. Um, the product, I mean, wow, I don't know. Actually, that's a hard one. I think, obviously, um, the film Half Past Autumn, The Life of Gordon Parks, is a big thing for me um, and, and for a lot, necessarily for a lot of people, because it was something that it really took me a long time to get off the ground and to, and to make. Um, and I learned a lot from him. I think that um, working with Prince was incredible. Uh, experience, it wasn't anything that I looked for, it happened. Um, Al Magnoli, who was the director of Purple Rain, called me and asked me if I wanted. I was assistant director at this time in, in New York. You want to come and make a movie in Minnesota? Yeah, it's because he remembered that's where I was. Yeah, that shit. Yeah, you know. I mean, that was the next 
you know, 10 years, it was like, it was like, it was no turning back. So, but it was just not that. It was all the lessons. It was, it was, you know, Paisley Park and developing. It was working with artists, other artists besides him, developing, you know, um, my own skills. Uh, we built Paisley Park Japan, which was an incredible experience for me to build something in Japan and to run something over there. Because I, that was an amazing experience for me and taught me a lot. Um, I think it's one of the things that actually sort of created this uh, the lack of ego because um, it's it's just they're so genuine. I mean, you know, it's, they it's so after a while you come up with your sort of your American attitude, you start to have to adjust it. Not, yeah, maybe cowboy is not the best way to go through. Yeah, life. exactly, exactly. It's like and be thankful and you know, so just much more genuine. So yeah, it's those, those experiences and yeah, it's it's uh, but. I, I look at every everything that I've ever done. Not that everything has been great, and I'm not going to sit here and pretend like that. But everything I do, kind of builds. I look at this is what I think. I think what it is, man. I look at life like a book, and you just I'm going through the pages, and there's an end of the book. I'm very clear about that. But you're going. I'm very clear, and as at my age right now, it's like, oh, wait a minute, there's not much left of this book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this yeah, 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 right, yeah. exactly. You know, it's like the this. But you go through it, and and you just keep turning the pages. You know, and that experience was great. I got something out of that. That was good. This was not so good. I'm glad that chapter's over and just kind of go through it that way. That's kind of how I approach it, you know. Your book's been pretty damn interesting. That's why I say that. <laughs> uh, speaking of books, and you mentioned Gordon Parks uh-huh. earlier too, um, I know that you've told a story where you credited your mom with giving um, you yeah. his book, A Choice of Weapons. Yeah. And yeah. there's this kind of a. Uh, concept of life weapons versus yeah. death weapons. Yeah, cho- cho- choosing life weapons over the death weapons. I'm, I was getting into trouble. I didn't get a lie about that. I'd been arrested a couple, well, not time, but that time, just really, really once when she g- gave it to me. Um, and what it was was that that I think she saw that there was uh, there was something else that I could do creatively. Because again, I mean, I think that I tell people. Um, Career criminals and filmmakers have a similar mentality. The Venn diagram <laughs> yeah, right. is awfully yeah. close. Yeah, yeah. right. Mm-hmm. And so if you know, if, you know, it's like you because you think it's about planning and you know and so, and developing and it's a, it's a heist film. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. exactly. So so she, I think she saw is gathering people together. So I think she saw some elements that she had had read in the book and gave me the book and it really was choosing life weapons over death weapons and it was really kind of the reason at that point in time really was I wanted to expose that because it's too easy to 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 to, to do some of the things that are negative um to but to learn how to use the camera to learn how to play an instrument to learn how to 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 gather g- capture life um was what was for me was in the book and I, I'm you know trust me it's like I'm glad that 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 she did that i mean she, she she and my 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 dad were great my dad had, had was less involved not because he wasn't around he just was i got like nine brothers or there's eight of us you know and uh so you know he wasn't he was working two jobs most of the time but you know yeah he was good so. yeah but you got both sides it's the hard yeah, work yeah. and and yeah. the Curiosity, yeah, openness, yeah, yeah, and the in the art. And my mom loved. I think it's, people say, "How did you go to the movies at such a young?" My mom loved movies, and so she didn't actually believe in children's movies. So she didn't take us to children's movies. So I mean, I, the reason I, I mean that obviously people know that I have said this before is I was five years old seeing Stalag Seventeen, and I remember watching this movie, and then I turned around and my mom said, "Who does this? <laughs> you know, somebody." Who does it? I mean, I'm not stupid. I know this. This is like not real life. But who makes this? And she said, "Well, the, 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 they have a script, and there's a director, and she knew enough about the process. I mean, not you know the basic, you know, that there's a script, and there's a director." And I said, "That's what I want to do." So I just figure out. And, and, and so I remember because I was stand, had to stand up because I couldn't sit in the seats and watch the movies. It was Sodom and Gomorrah, all those movies that were out, Samson and Delight, all those movies that were out in that kind of epic she saw, Lawrence Arabia, that's what I said. She was really into taking me to those movies, and when she couldn't, my aunt, her sister, would take me to, she 
I've seen every Rock Hudson and Doris Day movie ever <laughs> made. She loved those movies. You know, anything that had that James Garner, she was, my aunt was into those movies. So, you know, you can't say nothing about Doris Day or Rock Hudson that I don't know. I've seen them all, all Douglas Sirk movies, all that. She, she, we, and sometimes we go twice. She just loved those movies. No kidding. Yeah. And um, so, so it was the, everybody sort of, and I was just open to it. I think, you know, and my other brothers and sisters weren't as open to it. And that's not putting them down. They just, I was open to all of that stuff, you know? Where did you fall in the age range? I was second your... oldest. Second I have an oldest. older sister. And then the rest of them are younger. Yeah. I have five brothers and three sisters. Yeah. And you grew up in the Twin Cities? Yeah. Yeah. I was born in St. Paul and, and, and we grew, basically grew up in Minneapolis. I stayed in St. Paul a little bit when I was younger with my grandmother. And then I went to high school in St. Paul and then grade school in Minneapolis. So I'm actually kind of a trans city person. You know? I mean, I know both. I had a grandmother in Minneapolis, a grandpa in St. Paul. My father's from Minneapolis. My mother's from St. Paul. So I was, I've never been Yeah, people like to plant a flag if yeah, they're a yeah. Minneapolis St. Paul person. Uh, I've lived in both. I live yeah. in Roseville now, yeah. which touches yeah. both. Yeah, so I'm yeah, like, exactly. they're both great. Like, yeah. we don't need to yeah. choose. Well, I think St. Paul is the last of the East Coast cities, and Minneapolis is the first of the West Coast cities. So I think really... G- giving yourself both of those cities, you actually will understand America. That's actually that's pretty fascinating. Mm-hmm. I've never heard that before, mm-hmm. and I yeah. could make some parallels yeah. on mm-hmm. that front. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's a very, it's a very in, architecturally, you know, it's a very similar. We can go there, and you're you're going to get the more of the brownstone kind of East Coast side, side. And then Minneapolis is like if you don't, if it was old, tear it down, put <laughs> something new. It's Vegas, very modern. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay, so one of the things that that I I've always believed, I believe in Minnesota as a creative community creative and minneapolis is a creative center and i've always supported from the film board initially because i was one of the original people on the film board when perfect started it and tried to save it and i think that now where they are now with getting back the rebate on the level they have it i think it's going to be a real strong incentive for people to to make films here and i'm not talking about hollywood coming to save us i've always been against that i think it's important for us as as minnesotans to understand we need to create our own our own regional filmmaking i hate the term regional but you know what i'm saying so i'm um, film, with you. film society and filmmakers um we need to do that and then use that money for ourselves so that we are making a feature film or a tv series and then turning the money that minnesotans have actually put into it back into minnesota to enhance us um, so I think with this, the $25 million and next year, the $50 million, I think we really need to take advantage of that. What that means for filmmakers though, is they got to come to the table with some stuff. They can't just get away with, this is not about your cat in the playground. This is like a real story. They can actually can make some money, I think. But what I've tried to do since I've been at the film society now, which is a, which is purely about distribution and exhibition. And now that we got the five screens at the main and now we work through the Capri Theater uh, over off of Penn and 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 and, and Broadway. Uh, we actually work with the Landmark Center in St. Paul. We help them put a DCP system in their theater down there, so people in St. Paul will have have a movie theater. <laughs> if you live downtown in St. Paul, there is a movie theater that shows films occasionally. You don't need to go to the suburbs to watch something. Yeah, yeah, you don't have to go to the suburbs. You can actually walk down the street to to see films. So we try to do that. But so we're that, and then you have Film North. Um, and they're really there just to help to educate, develop, and connect network filmmakers that specifically starting, but also with filmmakers that are trying to get to the next level. I, we, we did something just recently. Um, we formed a sort of a, a cohort of the three of us, the Film Society, the Film and TV Board, and the Film Society to do what's called Minnesota Made. Um, uh, once a month, we show films with the filmmaker. We actually split the, the 50-50 with the filmmaker for the, the gate. Mm. Um, We've done that successfully. Some of them turned into more than one day runs because they've had a chance to do that. Um, but we're talking about really feature films that are made by Minnesotans with Minnesota content and doing that. And we've, we've had most of the films have been near sellouts now. Um, and I think that this is part of a process of us going back to where we were. People forget that Minnesota had made had been making films since the 20s. 26 was the, probably the first film. 1926 was the first film that was made here. I don't know. And, we, oh. and we've been doing this a long time. It's not new to us. We had the lapse, obviously, when the rebate went away, but we got to get back into making our own product and putting it out into the marketplace and being known for that. 
Um, and then obviously then you know, the filmmakers from other parts of the country will come to us or other parts of the world and uh, I will come here because we're back to we're back on the block and that's a building process um, but it's also a process where young filmmakers have to understand you have to network you have to collaborate um, and you have to work with the best people that you can get you know not just to try to I want to make something it's this is a the problem with filmmaking I think for a lot of people is you have to understand that it's not about you it's not about you. It's about a collaboration of people coming together. And most filmmakers, I think, uh, or I should say most, some filmmakers come at it thinking, I just want to do this movie my way. And, I, you know, it's like on, being on the distribution side is like I go, because I watch so many films for the film festivals and stuff like that, I've seen thousands of films, that, not just by us here in town, obviously, but just all over. People forget that other people have to watch this. You know, I mean, they're going to have, in order for it to be successful or financially successful or just uh, cr critically successful, people have to want to watch your movie. And if it doesn't attract people to do that, you're not going to be successful at this. Yeah. You know? uh, I'm super thrilled to hear that those, the organizations are working together because mm -hmm. one of my criticisms about the or organizations, but also it drips down to the filmmakers, mm -hmm. is there, but there's been a lack of collaboration. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. feels like everybody's working in their silo and you're talking yeah. about, you know, filmmakers mm -hmm. not collaborating. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes you'd find, you know, these film organizations in town, mm -hmm. they'd schedule events for the same night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like we, if we can't figure that out, right, mm -hmm. how are we mm -hmm. going to figure, how are we going to educate yeah. the filmmakers that they need to start collaborating? Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, um, yeah. and th that's what we're working on. And I think that the, the, this Minnesota made um, movies, I mean, even the Jerome is involved. I mean, so. To pull all these four organizations together and co co and collaboration is really important, and it's something that I really truly believe. I think that all boats rise, and I and I, I you know, we're not Hollywood. We got to get that out of our heads. We never will be Hollywood, and Hollywood's never going to come and save us. We have to save ourselves, and that means we need to create an internal process of understanding. We need all of ourselves to work towards that. You know, and, and the filmmakers are part of that, but also the equipment houses are part of that, the post-production houses are part of that, and all the organizations that promote film are part of that. Yeah, I see this incentive as not saving us, but hopefully building an infrastructure. Yeah, exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, these filmmakers working on these larger projects mm -hmm. can take a month off mm -hmm. and go do their project mm -hmm. or work on somebody else's right. project, and we can all right. collaborate and, right. and not wait for somebody yeah. to fly in on a, you know... Yeah. Yeah, on a white horse. Yeah, and and I have no problem with Hollywood films coming here. You know, I mean, I worked on Untamed Heart and a bunch of these films. I think they're great because you learn stuff from those people too. Mm -hmm. You know, but I think then people think that you know that's what we need, like Atlanta or something. That's not who we are. I think there's enough creative energy in this community that we can create our own work. If you really think about it, I mean, from writers to directors to actors, we have enough creative engine here to do our own things. Not to say that we we're going to run people out and say, don't shoot here, don't come here. But we got to not look at them like Atlanta looks at it or, you know, or New Mexico looks at it. We're, we're not just a place for you to do work. We have so much creative energy. We've mm -hmm. been exporting it for yeah. the last yeah. 20 years, yeah. right? Exactly. People are going to the coast <laughs> exactly. to do the work. Yeah. Yeah. Oftentimes, yeah. they don't want to. Yeah. They'd yeah. rather be here. Yeah. So if, yeah. we can, if we can yeah. build that, I think yeah. we're going to be in a really... Exactly. And... You know, and I think the you know, we, yeah, that's exactly what it is. It really is. We can just build it back up again, so that we can use the actors, we can use the directors, we can use, you know. So. Yeah, yeah. Having navigated both the mm -hmm. music and film worlds, mm -hmm. have you found any similarities working with the people in 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 those? Um, I think the similarity is that I mean, I mean, obviously that the Minnesota still is a music center, not on the level it was. Uh, but it, it again another thing that's always been here. I mean, we've had an orchestra. We've had, I mean, going all the way back to Eddie Cochran, and we've always had hit records coming out of here and hit artists coming out of here. I think that that recently there's been sort of, um, and it's been sort of confusing what is a hit recording artist because the record industry is dead. That doesn't mean the music industry is dead. That means just the recording industry is the dead. old way. Of it. Yeah, the old way of it is dead. So right now, what it is is building back up our musicians recognition and that means musicians are going to have to tour and i think some of them are doing that on a regular basis now they have to build up their own audience and i think that the social media is the only way to sort of build your audience outside of the, the twin cities onto the lakes of the quad 
areas or even the five state areas or the Midwest, you just got to start working that way. It's not what a lot of musicians like to hear, but it's the only way you've got to cut through the clutter uh, what that's out there because I mean, you, every once in a while, everybody's got an artist that they like, which is great, you know, but you know, we need to distinguish excellent work and not mediocre work. Um, and that only comes with the, exposing them to a larger audience. I mean, what we really need is we need the Beatles back again. <laughs> they said they said the crown work. They were like the standard. They did the Beatles, and then everybody else. They restructured the music industry, and then obviously the record industry. And we need. We They're need, still doing it. They just released a yeah, song. I know, I know. I mean, you know, it's like it's the, because before people don't know what it was like before the Beatles came. It was like it was all the music industry was all over the place, and the records weren't really making any money, and people weren't, you know, it's just. You were on tour sometimes, and you know the hit artists were played in clubs, and you know I just think it was it's we need a standard setter, and then we need to be, we as Minnesotans, and I can uh, put us in the mix. I think we can do that. We can get back to having really large artists like Bob Dylan, like Prince, like J- J- Al Jarreau, Al. You know, we can get back to that kind of stuff, or get Gypsy, or any of those groups that were out there. Mm-hmm. You know. Do you do you feel like we do a good job of supporting our artists here, Minnesota? Yeah. Oh, I think Minnesota loves the arts, but doesn't love the artists. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, there's a story of a, a famous photographer who um, couldn't get a show here, mm-hmm. and yeah. then got a show in New York, and then all of a mm-hmm. sudden, everybody here was like, uh. Yeah. Come back, please. Yeah. Sorry, we yeah. didn't, you know, we didn't take know advantage of you. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, and for, I love again. I, I I'm a, I'm a child of of the North Country, and so I, I, but I've seen that my whole life that this they love the arts. They, yeah, they will have the largest grants and biggest theaters and greatest museums and stuff like that. But the way they treat their artists, you know, yeah. There's a term I'm trying to uh, introduce into the lexicon mm-hmm. called toxic humility, yeah. and I think Minnesotans suffer from that yeah. pretty dramatically, yeah. where mm-hmm. it extends to everybody else mm-hmm. because we are mm-hmm. such community focused, yeah. right? Like mm-hmm. we kind of we do work together on a lot yeah. of aspects, yeah. but if somebody sticks their head up a little bit too high, mm-hmm. they're like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. "Nope, yeah. come back down a little bit." We will consume whatever you're putting out there, but in yeah. terms of you, you know, yeah. rising above, it's yeah. it's tricky. Yeah, I mean, and so I think that that. That's and again, we're not the only place that, but most places don't love the arts as much as we do here. I mean, they've not put out as much capital to build facilities for art as we have done here. I just think it, and we all know artists that are struggling beyond what they need to, and they're not respected on the level that they need to be respected by the city overall. I mean, you, you know, I'm not saying we're Paris, but I mean, imagine if we had the same kind of feeling uh, as artists that you have when you go to Paris. That, that, that you know, that 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 being an artist is a calling. Yep. You know, it's not it's not necessarily a choice. I mean, trust me. If I had a, had a, if I did not choose this, it was chosen for me, and I'm just trying to be the best I can. And I think most artists feel that way too. That that I'm just trying to be the best that I can. But the struggle to, to survive and to maintain here is very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. It's here. Mm-hmm. We just yeah. got to make it yeah. happen. Yeah, that's part of the reason why I'm doing this podcast yeah. too. Is mm-hmm. like we need to start talking about this, mm-hmm. yeah, more and mm-hmm. lifting everybody mm-hmm. up. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that you know, with you, I'm sorry to mean to cut you no, off. No, you're but good. I think that 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 um, take a prize appointment of the I call them the art czar. You know, is Johnson is really smart. Um, I think he's dedicated. He came back, moved back here to have this position to promote art and the artists in town and he has a little bit of money he needs more money but he's actually doing this and i'm i think everybody should really be the path to his office so that he is the champion or at right now he's new but he's is the champion and i think after the first of the year he will really kind of become the center point of i don't want to say our frustrations but our desires mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Should have him on here maybe yeah you should yeah i mean he's he's great we did a panel um a month ago at the walker um, uh, just talking about art and getting audiences and developing, getting back. I mean, it was a, uh, Chris Hewitt narrated it, and it was good because I just think he's he's he, we have a spokesperson. I guess that's the way to say that, you know, as opposed to because nobody's gonna listen to me and they're not gonna listen to you because we're in it, you know. Yeah, we have an agenda gonna, yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 
Uh, let's talk about M. Smith a little yeah. bit, Minneapolis sure. St. Yeah. Paul yes. International Film Festival. Yes. Um, Two part question: mm-hmm. A, how is the organization doing? We know that mm-hmm. they did, mm-hmm. you know, these, these recent upgrades on the mm-hmm. main, and it's looking fantastic. And then I want to talk about kind of the films and how you mm-hmm. see um, the festival kind of yeah. world moving in the future. Yeah. I think that that Men's Rift, you know, this was this forty three years or forty four years? I can't remember. It um, is an international independent film festival, and it's doing well. Um, the main is the theater and it's off the old St. Anthony main theater, but it's now called the main since now we control it. Um, and, uh, it shows films regularly all year round now. And it's, and so, but we still try to keep sort of a mix between sort of the Hollywood fair fair and independent international films in there. But the international film festival is really dedicated and has been for all these number of years to, to the process of showing films from all over the world. It's, it's, I, we try to come up with this idea that you can see the world and stay, still be at home, you know? So we show probably a couple hundred films, I mean, feature films. We did, I think we, we, think we did 170 last year, which is kind of a good number. We try to show everything at least once or twice if we can. And then there's a number of shorts, which is probably another hundred shorts. Excuse me. Um, we st- August, I think it's August 11th. It's a 14-day festival. Um, what we try to do this year is we're really kind of going, now that we've sort of had some lead time and have been financially somewhat set, I think, let me back up. Not having our own theater, um, we wouldn't have survived hmm. economically, um, especially after the pandemic and um, just... We had one theater and we just showed films. No one, we couldn't make enough revenue. Now, by having five theaters, we can actually leverage the economics. So now we have a, a little bit more lead time. So how do we want to develop this festival and try to ratchet it up to the next level? Um, I think that that th- this is going to be an interesting year because I think the the international cinema world is more tapped into us, and that's something we started several years ago is try to get the world to know who we were because again, so we can attract films because you got to sort of attract films. So we've been doing that really well. I think also what we've tried to do at um, the festival is try to um, distinguish ourselves from from the Twin Cities Film Festival, which I'm fine with that. I mean, that's that that festival is what it is and does a lot. You guys have different vibes for sure. Yeah, different yeah. vibes, and I think you 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 have to have them too. And they're in the in the fall. Um, so ours is coming not so much about it's a filmmaker audience festival. Um, is kind of how we gear it up and want to do more and more of that. Right, so I think that's been really, really good. And and our 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 level of programming, we got we have an international programmer. I program a Jesse Kelly Nathy. He does a lot of the short programming. So we've really kind of created a really strong group of people um, to do the the programming for the film festival. And we've already started. I've seen our almost eighty movies. You know so. You know, which is like kind of makes you sort of dizzy after watching. Yeah, I mean, tell me about that. I've I've had to watch a few for like sub jury yeah, uh, yeah. stuff, and like watching a handful gets yeah. to be a lot. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. yeah. How I do you think, how do you find uh, the energy and <laughs> and the concentration? Yeah, it's um, n- luckily now with most things come to you online as before in the old days, and I can say that since I've been there for almost fourteen years, the DVDs were were pro- but being online. Um, is better, you know, because I can be in my office and I can just, you know, I can see at least three or four films a day. I have to watch myself though, because um, when I was at, at SC, you used to have to sometimes watch four or five films. Sometimes there were days that you had to watch six films a day for classes and, you know, stuff like that. I mean, SC really makes you watch films a lot, maybe a little too much, but that was, but you learn to watch them and keep yourselves, sometimes you watch them standing up, but just to keep alert. I have to watch myself because as a programmer, you really have to be fair. They didn't make, what you learn is that they didn't make this movie for me, you know? They, I have to watch them and say, I gotta select them for you, the audience. So it's not, do I like this movie? Do I think the audience is gonna like this movie? And that's the difference in a programming persona and then a, your own personal 
you know, I don't like horror film. I don't know why anybody life is horror <laughs> enough. Why would you make a film about it? Just wake up, you know. You know, it's got its own hair, you know, uh, hairy elements to it in regular life. But I try to um, really watch films and say, would an audience like this? And then, so you judge it on based on that. That's my first education, entertainment, enlightening our criteria in that for an audience. If it doesn't have that, I don't care if. Roger Deakins shoots it. I, that's not, mm-hmm. I mean, that's mm-hmm. or I'm not going to put it in the festival. Yeah. Yeah, I guess having that layer of abstraction mm-hmm. where you have mm-hmm. to kind of look at it from yeah. a different point of view probably, yeah. yeah, it gives you a different insight. Yeah, it does. And you, so you watch it a different way. Yeah, I, I learned that. But because if you watch it like what I like, that's not fair to the audience, you know? It really isn't, you know. If I if it was or what I liked, it'd be John Woo movies and Truffaut movies. And, you know, that's not, it's called the yeah, yeah Craig Rice Film Festival. Yeah, right, exactly. So you mm-hmm. you learn that's that's so that's how you can do it. You just basically take yourself out of it and judge it based on a, a set of criteria. Because, um, yeah, that's what you do. You what, really, yeah. What's your take on the current state of um, independent or international film? Um, so far, based on, on on what I've seen and what we have coming in. Um, every year, this is an interesting process. And I, I, there's a collective consciousness in the world, um, which you can we we as filmmakers really really see, because I would probably say I can't remember it was maybe six years ago, seven years ago, everything was about ecology hmm. and fracking, and everything was about that. That's over, you know. And so you know, then last year specifically was a lot about you know. Uh, Fluid sexuality, I mean, I don't even know, transsexual, I mean, there's mm-hmm. a lot of that. And I haven't seen that much this year. This year, uh, probably, we're talking about that, is that a lot of films coming in about aging, age, you know? It's a thing. You know? Yeah, yeah. So, I'm saying, so, so y- y- there's not one thing that films, I mean, there's always going to be the cop shows, and I mean, there's always going to be that, but you realize, oh, people are thinking about, again, what, what happened to all the ecology films? I mean, we had, some, one year we had so many of them, we had to like not show some because it was all about that. But you realize that that's where everybody was at, global warming, ecology, you know, save the fish and fracking and, you know, I mean, you know, and then that kind of, it just shifts to something else and it shifts to something. Like last year was a lot about um, civil rights, George Floyd, you know, that, so things shift. And so as filmmakers, you try to tap into a little bit of stuff so people keep current. I mean, this is what we do at the International Film Festival. Not everybody does that. We're not going for what is the hottest thing, but we try to come up with what we think is important. Again, enlightenment, education, and entertainment. Have you found any trends in terms of the actual style or production method? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, do do you get to see any yeah. like oh the you know we're going handheld this year or yeah. you know anything like that? A lot more documentaries. I mean, a real lot more documentaries. I mean, significant more documentaries this year internationally by people. So which is different, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know if that's part of, that may be part economics. The cost of making a film and actors and stuff might be part of what's driving it internationally, but also the fact that I think filmmakers, good filmmakers, I should say, want to t- tell a story that they think is important, and so that's sometimes harder to do in a fictional scenario and a little easier to do in a documentary. So some interesting docs um, coming out, and I think that's true. So so the handheld part of it's great. What I have seen, this is another thing I've seen, a lot more animation in documentaries. Hmm. You know. This, I mean, you, it used to be, you know, I they sort of avoided the the the, um, the reenactment, and they used animation to sort of cover up some of the sequences or explain some of the sequence. I've seen probably four so far of docs that I've seen that have used different forms of animation inside of them. Hmm. Yeah, which is interesting. I mean, even people, Sam Polart's his latest one, animation. So they, it's kind of a combination now. So you say, okay, how do I show, and I'm just making this up, how do I show... The, you know, the boy got kidnapped, you know, and spent three years in this gulag. Well, now I don't want to try to reenact that because everybody knows what that looks like, you know. So they've decided to make it with voiceover and then, you know, with animation to give you a feeling of what that is visually than to try to reenact it, you know. Yeah, it sounds like the subject of a master's thesis, and I'm not. It's obviously a reaction to something, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, you know, yeah, and yeah. maybe we need a few more years to understand yeah, what yeah, that is. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, it is that communal thing that's mm-hmm, happening. Mm-hmm. Huh. Yeah, and using any collaborative use of other aspects a lot. Uh, 
of uh, visual effects. Um, I mean, just sort of, and I want, this is not the right term, but I'm going to think of right now, sort of more hallucinogenic visuals that sort of discuss kind of what the feeling was, is like in the character's mind, which, which is a different kind of animation, not really animation, more, yeah, just swirling lights and dissolving flowers and stuff like that. It's more of that. Internal. Yeah, yeah. yeah in, in, you know, uh, in there. So again, it's not these, the, I, most of the, no longer just the straight documentary kind of things or docs with reenactments. The people have become much stronger in the visualization of documentary film. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Probably yeah. needed a little yeah, bit. Yeah, and I yeah. think with the amount of, I mean, MCAT has the largest department now at MCAT is animation. No kidding. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so I think that that's also true in Savannah and some other places are realizing an animation for some younger people um, have, have overshadowed the film department. How much is the uh, rise of AI being discussed like at oh, the that's school? Like every, and... That's everybody. everybody. <laughs> I, I mean, some of it's, I, let me take the, let me, let me back up. Yes, AI is in everybody's conversation about everything from writing, you know, uh, scripts or treatments or even grants um, and AI, the fear of AI stealing people's souls is, you know, <laughs> their images and their souls is there constantly. I think that, that it's going to take people smarter than me, obviously, to, to sort of come up with some kind of guidelines for this. I mean, I have read a, a, a grant that was created by AI and it's good, mm -hmm. you know, and it you know, literally is. All, and I'm not saying people need to do that. I'm not suggesting filmmakers do that. But you, you know, having written grants, it's hard, you know. And if you can just put some information into it and let the just, okay, go for it, and then just correct it, you know, as a writing tool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, I can look at the yeah. sum of human <laughs> yeah, grant writing right, yeah, right. and find all the best practices and say, yeah, here you go. Answer the question that, you know, what's usually, you know, filling out grants is like, what's the purpose of this story to the larger humanity? I don't know, you know, but you put that in AI, AI can tell you. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you can often tell, I can mm -hmm. tell when mm -hmm. something's written by AI, yeah. mm -hmm. but it's so early, Yeah, six yeah. months from now. Yeah, yeah. We won't feel yeah, like yeah, that. and again, I think that people need to they need to rewrite it, but it, you know that's a lot easier than trying to sit there for three hours trying to figure out what is the right direction for this. You know, yeah, it's gonna be, it's gonna be fascinating. Yeah, that yeah, that much yeah. is for sure. Yeah, and I think that that we all have seen enough of images from the volume. I don't know if you've seen the movie The Killer. Not yet. No, 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 no. So yeah. a lot of that's uh, is in the volume. They didn't make the all the car stuff, the train stuff. All this stuff was shot in the studio. Yeah, you know, and you know, we know Fincher is like you know a geek about computer stuff like that. So a lot of that film is not on location at all. Yep. And um, for whatever reason, that's he did did it the way he did it. But um, so I think we're getting to the point in time where a lot of the digital technology, computer technology, AI technology is going to be embedded in to the process of making films, and possibly because it helps to eliminate some of the cost and time time and money are really more linked now than ever before and you know this because when i first started making film you had sort of uh, when you finish shooting a film you know for eight weeks or whatever you still have almost a year of post-production well that doesn't exist anymore you know they're looking at you being done in the next four months and so you know what's taking you so long kind of attitude and you're making not necessarily smart choices you're making the best choices you can with the time you've got to in front of you so things are just accelerated in the process of making it because your film will be out for you know in the theater maybe if you're lucky for eight weeks or four weeks and then this guy's you know that's going into streaming and then god help you but you it doesn't get any traction there it just gets lost in the, the you know the swamp yeah yeah so i shot i shot at a volume wall uh, mm -hmm. for a little spot mm -hmm. um for the audience, volume walls, a volumetric wall where it's usually like a curved screen. Mm -hmm. You can put an actor in it, and it looks like they're actually in the location. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, and it was both amazing and depressing. Mm -hmm. I felt empty, and it wasn't mm -hmm. like a wholly creative mm -hmm. endeavor. Like it was a spot, so I, mm -hmm. I get it. But I, it, there was something missing. Yeah. yeah. For me, mm -hmm. does the audience give a shit? Yeah. Probably not. Yeah. You know, yeah. and. I'm I'm wrestling with yeah, that myself yeah. right now. And it, yeah, it, I've I've never done the volume. I've done green screen work, and I, I'm somebody who, who, when I was directing a lot of music videos and stuff like that, I, 
I'm a director that has to go to the location. I real I found that out about myself the hard way. Uh, I was doing I've been doing a Mavis Staple video, and I had been doing videos back to back, and it was like, do do you want to go on a location scout? No, which every director should go to the location scout. I think I was in my getting full of my own self, and I decided not to go until the day we shoot. And I had made my shot list at home, but I came to the location and realized I had no idea the location capacity to do what I wanted it to do. And, and so I had to stop and redo the whole thing, recreate the whole thing in my head. I, I, to, for me, the place speaks to me. The location speaks to me. So I need that. Now, I don't know how that works in a volume, you know, is, you know, I, and I'm getting, I know people, and some people might think this is bullshit, but I have to be there and say, okay, this is how, you can block. This is how you can stage this. This is where they come through the door. This is what this does. This is when they, they look out the window. All that stuff. I have to be there in that space in order to to decide. I'm not somebody who can just do it on my own and do storyboards and shit like that. I can't just do it because I, okay, they stand by the windows. <laughs> and that's what I did on that video. And I realized, oh, that doesn't exist in this space. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I'm worried that we're going to get so digital and artificial mm-hmm. that we're not going to notice it. Yeah. Yeah. Until at a certain mm-hmm. point, we're like, it's, what's the, you know, mm-hmm. that piece that's yeah. missing, yeah. you know? Yeah. And yeah. do we rebel at that point? Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, who knows? Yeah. And I think, well, I think, I think we as directors, and I know I'm seeing your work, so you, you have to, you're going to have to work with people because that's what you feel. And you realize that, that it, it's like a video game. You know, yes, Red Dead Two, incredible. I mean, it's like, oh, I like, I just want to see the movie. But you know, there's a there's a a lack of of rhythm in the characters that are is, that that you need as a human to relate to other humans. You know, there's a, there's there, and and as a director, you want let's try that, let's try it more this way to the actor as opposed to you know telling AI that this is what you want, you yeah. know, can you be, can the character be a little bit more relaxed? It's like, what? It's like, you know, I mean, I, I think that I, I, we'll see. I mean, it's like music. When, when I was in the industry and this is in, as now industries, there's the, 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 the auto tune, you know, I mean, and again, you know, you want to hear musicians scream about that. It's like, you know, can Britney sing? No, Britney can't sing. I mean, she can sing, but she can't hit the notes, mm-hmm. you know? And most people in real life, now that auto-tune is, is instantaneous, they'd use them on concerts. And yep. so, you know, most of the people that are out there supposedly singing can't sing a note to save their life. They just either have the presentation, and they it's unfortunate, good. you know? Yeah. You know? And, and I just think that we may not be around to see this, we may not need me to talk about it. You know, you know, we might be gone by the time it takes over. It's our kids' problems. And, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Know. Exactly. You know, I was. You know, it's like it, but it's coming. That they're going to upload your consciousness into yeah, the cloud, yeah. and then you're going to be one of those. Yeah. 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 yeah I mean, I think uh, the, it, will there be a ver- version of auto tuning in the visual world? Yes, there will be. Yes, there will be. Mm-hmm. Man, there's nothing you can do to stop it. Make peace again. With I'm catering to diets, not to fads. <laughs> That's what I do, you know. Love it. Uh, selfish question. You brought up Mavis Staples. Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't care if you lie to me, but mm-hmm. she was lovely, right? Oh, God. I, I loved that woman. She was the... It's funny because, you know, I'm a, of all the Beatles, I'm a George Harrison fan, mm-hmm. you know, so... He's my favorite, too. Yeah, yeah, and so the fact that they had a relationship for a long time tells me that that's... Of course, he would. That would be the, the one, you know. Mm-hmm. Not Paul, not John, but George. I mean, there's a soulfulness to her mm-hmm. um, that's so tender and so real, and you can just sit with her and talk to her, and she will talk back to you, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, yeah, no, she was she was great. I love the, you know, and I yeah, she's one of the the real one. The real. I, I fell in love with her watching the last waltz. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. just that presence yeah, and the things that yeah. she would do. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. when she wasn't even really performing or on yeah. camera, like, yeah, this yeah. woman's on another level. Yeah, she's on a whole other level, and she's just so genuine, so and so tapped into caring about people on the, in the world. And her her spirituality is not on her sleeve; it's in her heart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you can feel it. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. 
Okay. Yeah. Well, you made my day on that. <laughs> Talking to mm-hmm. younger creatives, which mm-hmm. you do all day, every day. Yeah. Can you encap- encapsulate any any, you know, elevator advice? I think that the younger filmmakers need to. Uh, first of all, this is why I encourage all my students. Is first of all, understand there is no prelude to life. You're living your life right now, and if you want to be good at doing creative work, whatever that is, you have to work hard. There's no way. And I was talking to my, my, my brother I was in Arkansas. I said, w- one of the things that I really learned from friends, and I use it all the time, is that there are three phases for, for artists. And it's one is practice, rehearsal, performance. A lot of people want to skip over the practice part, go to, like, I'm doing this, and then they want to perform it or show it. You got to go back to practice. How do you practice to be a director? There's a way of practicing to be a director. There's a way of practicing to be a cinematographer, actor. Practice, practice, practice every day. Just like you would if you're a musician, just like if you were a painter, you practice, you know. And then, you know, then the, then the rehearsal part of it is actually getting, figuring out what you want to do and how do you want to make this work. Because if, if you're a cameraman, you know, practicing the, the moves. If it's a director, it's like, how do you want to block this? But, and then the performance is obviously when you're actually doing it. But those phases, you really have to sort of define for yourself. You can't skip over. And the one that gets skipped over most often is practice. I mean, I was a musician, so I know, and been around enough musicians that they'd never practice their instrument. This is, they come to rehearsal and say, okay, so what am I doing? You know, and you, did you practice? No, you didn't. You just rehearse. You just want to rehearse. Now you're wasting all of our time. Yeah, you're yeah. wasting all of our time. And, and so that's one thing that I encourage. So work, rehearsal, practice, performance in those phases. Um, and when people say, how do, you, how do I rehearse being a director? Well, first of all, you need to read a lot. You need to write descriptively a lot. You need to watch a lot. More movies than you think you can possibly watch, you need to watch them. And then really determine the style. And then figure out that the rehearsal part of it is like, what do I do? I'm not, I don't, again, I don't like horror movies, but I also don't, I don't get all the technology. I mean, I'm not somebody who understands motion graphics really well. So... Uh, do I need to rehearse that process? Like when I did the first time I did green screen, I had to figure out, I had to look a bunch of green screen stuff up and figure out how to do it and and figure out what I need to do and work with the, I really had to meet with the visual effects director because, you know, and say, okay, what does that mean? You know? Yeah. Before we got on the sound stage and started doing it so that I wasn't like totally out of, pocket you know that's it that's the thing so that's my advice to young people and i think the other side of what i tell young people is that it, this is not brain surgery it's okay failure is okay and you'll learn from that failure and don't beat yourself up and don't decide i can't do this maybe you can't be a cinematographer Maybe you can be an editor. Maybe you can be a, a writer and not a director. Maybe you can be a production designer. But don't think because you failed that one thing means that this is not the right place for you. Just find your place in here. Yeah. Get in where you fit in. Mm-hmm. That's great. Uh, any tools or technology that you use in your everyday life? I see you have a notepad, so yeah. you must be a good note taker. Hey. Any there you go. <laughs> yeah. I used to have a director's finder, regular old fashioned one, but I use, uh, you know, uh, the um, Atomus now when I do that. Um, computer. I love the computers. I mean, everybody has sort of a love hate relationship with their computer, but I love the computer. You can literally go online and create a storyboard. You used to have to, when I was, you know, cut out of magazines, and you, know, you can literally find an image kind of that's close to what you want. It'll help you discuss with the production designer or the director what you're trying to go for. You can do that. Um, or even the act, type of actor you're looking for, the face or whatever. I think that's great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, final question, uh-huh. kind of the yeah. shout out section, mm-hmm. and you've done a really good job of shouting out a ton of people, but. Yeah. Is there anybody locally or an organization or a restaurant or a store or a band, whomever, that you feel needs a little bit more attention, a little bit more love? <laughs> um, well, I think, Matt, you do, first of all. Oh. You've been around a long time. Thank so, you. Um, and you've done the work, which is, you know, a lot of people talk about the work, but you've done the work. So I Thank give you. you a shout out for that. Um, I think there are some people out there. Um, 
uh, Brian Few Jr., who's a, a, I think he's got two Emmys. He's a cameraman out there. I've known him since he st started out as a PA, you know, and just been doing the work. Um, he's shooting out there. I think that, I think what Melanie Behan did at the film uh, board, I, I couldn't get it done. She got it done. She got the incentive back. And I got, we all need to applaud her for that. Um, I think that, um, I'd like to the, this 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 cohort of the film board, film society, film North, and Jerome coming together. Um, I think it's great. I think that I, what I caution people to do is I know everybody's got there's an independent film group and all. I think that that we got to be careful that we don't fracture ourselves. Again, we have to sort of come together um, because as a unit we will survive. Um, I think I applaud, um, I try to think of anybody else I can think of off the top of my head. I mean, I, I, I just, I, I, I'm excited about the future. It's probably the best way from both music, film, theater, television. Um, I love the fact that TPT has a new, uh, executive director, president, you know, Sylvia Strobel, who was here years ago, who came back and is now taking the, the reins of this, trying to get back into production um, and, and, and starting to really create productions here. I think that's going to be good for us because she understands that they can always just like show what PBS sends them, but we need to start creating our own product. And she's really kind of dedicated to that and raising funds for that process. So, yeah. You know. Well, I think uh, when your autobiography is written, Excited for the Future might be a, a pretty good title for yeah. that. Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty good. That's actually the best yeah. sense. It's like, you know, I like that you, title. You can you steal know? it. We'll cut this out of the thing yeah, and take right. all the credit for it. But thank you for being here. This no, no, was thanks awesome. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it, man. I really do.